It said it wanted an American, and I looked at the the audition script, and I thought, well, yeah, you want an American for all the Americans in the book, but I really <laughs> think the narration would work better as as my natural British speaking voice, just as yeah. it steps sets just slightly outside the story and tells the story, so that it makes story. the characters more powerful. When I'd rather than me doing an American accent for the narration, and I've done that too. I've done books where I've done an American accent for the narration, but I think yeah, I think you're right. I think there is something about having a British accent for the narration, and then the the, na the natural accents of the characters, whether they're American, Russian, oh, yeah. Vietnamese, and whatever. That's what they are. You I think you're able to do. I mean. I found that out. I mean, because I looked up your website and I, you had like at the time over 150 books you've done. Yeah. And, I, and you know, and I can go in there and listen to samples, and it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. There's Bridget Jackson there, but oh wait a minute, there's that female character that may, you know, there's this, you know, so yeah. you had it. Charlie instructed the security to hold the KGB agents as he and Ryan went back to the barn. Heads up, everyone gather around, Charlie announced. First, with the non-disclosure statements you've signed, you all realize that this is a classified operation. The real deal, guys, and people are going to get killed tonight. By you. Warren, how are you? I am great. How are you today? Very good. You're looking good, and you're sounding good. And uh, uh, that is good news, I suppose, because you were just telling me you, you had a stroke a little while ago. Well, yeah, quite a while March ago. 20, March 22, had a stroke. So that's been a year and a half and been very fortunate recovering. I mean, I'm still not walking great. I still got to use a cane and left arm, but I'm moving along. I ramble sometimes. Uh, so watch out. I'm warning you now. <laughs> so. oh, I'm sure it won't be a problem. And you're in St. Yeah. Louis, Missouri. Yeah, St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah, I've been to born St. Louis. In New York City and relocated here after the army. Uh, Where were you born? Missouri. I was born in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, but I grew up in New York. Yeah. And uh, joined the army, met my wife. And uh, so we've been married like 47 years now, something like that. I forgot, did you, I meet, forgot did you meet her in the army? No, she, no, I was stationed in Kansas. Yeah. And so I met her there, you know. But, yeah. So yeah, and it was you were in the you were in the service twenty one years. So thank you very much for your service. You know, because if it wasn't for the U.S. Army, I'd be talking to you in German right now. There we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so um, twenty one years in the service. What did you do in the army? What was your job? In I started there? out in the infantry, then I got bored with that and went into the military police. Yeah. And then I got sent to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and I seen people jumping out of airplanes. I said, Oh, I got to do that. Ooh, you know. So I did that. And then I went into Green Berets. And that, you know, the second half of my career I was in the Green Berets. So did that and got wow. to travel a lot. My family got to travel a lot too. So we, you know, globe trotting family. And so it was fun. Enjoyed it. Globe trotting. So not just Kansas. Whereabouts did you go no, around Kansas, the globe? Kansas, uh, North Carolina, uh, Washington State, then overseas to uh, Okinawa, Japan. Wow. wow. And so that's where the family got to go. And plus me and then I got to go to places like Philippines, Korea, um, you know, Thailand, you know, things like that. So, you know, did a lot of stuff. And why did you join the army? Do you remember the reason, the thing that made you think, oh, I want to be a soldier? Well, I joined at an unpopular time. Uh, it was 1975. Vietnam? Yeah, well, Vietnam would have been just winding up then, wouldn't it? Yeah, Vietnam ended a few years earlier. I was what you would call too old, to go, too young to go to Vietnam. Yeah. I joined when I was 18 in 1975. Yeah. And part, I mean, a big part, part was just the patriotism thing in my head. You know, I had that. Yeah. Another thing was the necessity, uh, because at the I had to drop out of high school due to some family issues that were going yeah. on, and so we needed a place to go. Yeah. And so that was where you can get health care and dental and oh yeah, it was that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because when you're you're young, young, you don't think of that stuff, but yeah, that was a that was a big benefit, especially after getting married and having kids. So yeah. that was good. I went to a radio convention once in Los Angeles called the Morning Show. Uh, war college with Dan O'Day and there was a guy I met on that and he was in the army and um, he was with uh, American Forces Broadcasting which 
to, to for you know it, for Brit we have BFBS British Forces Broadcasting, but the guys that and I know guys who've worked on British Forces Broadcasting, they're not actually in the army, but in America, American Armed Forces Radio, they Gosh. are soldiers. They have to go to boot camp and everything. So this guy was a guy. He was living in I think it was Kentucky. He was in and. Uh, his girlfriend got pregnant and he realized he needed all the health care and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. So he decided he'd join the army and be American Forces Broadcasting and get all the benefits that come with that and the married quarters oh, yeah. and everything. So he married her and he and he <laughs> and then they went through boot camp and everything, and then they posted him in Korea. <laughs> 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 but that's the army for you, isn't it? That's, yeah. that's the chance you take. And he was and he would, he'd flown from Korea to Los Angeles to go to this this broadcasting convention. The army <laughs> had flown him. But yeah, so uh there's a, there's a lot of service people and ex-service people that I've done audio books for. I was talking to Julie, uh, my wife, and I, she said, oh, who's your interview with tonight? I said, oh, it should be a good one tonight. I said, it's, a, it's an ex-soldier who's written a military-type book set in the Cold War, which is one of my favorite periods to do books from. And she said, oh, yeah. I said, yeah, yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. And then I realized I'd done a lot of military people, guys who've served in the Marines and the Army or some were actually in the forces. There's a... There's a guy who works as a sniper, and I'm doing a book for him now, and he's he's based in Alaska. And there's a guy who's a father and son who are both Marines, and I did uh, their books of short stories that they did together. They, you know, they did uh, lots of different stories, and they combined them into a book. So what is it about the military and, and authors? I mean, it's something I wouldn't have thought of have before I met so many authors. Stories. Oh, I talk about characters, maybe too. I don't know. Oh, yeah. You mean, yeah, along the way. Lots of characters. Yeah. Good and bad. So yeah. funny and not so funny. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'm guessing <laughs> then your military service inspired this book because this is a this is a terrific book. This is a rip roarer of a book. It's it's what what happened to Jacob Walden. Forgotten Soldiers is the title, as you can see on the screen there. Forgotten Soldiers by Warren Martin. And what happened to Jacob Walden? Just tell me. I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but he's a soldier in Vietnam who's captured and then spends many, many years in captivity. And uh, during the, the Cold War period there, and uh, it's it's an amazing story of survival and hope and and patriotism. Um, tell me about how you came up with the story. Where did this all start? It, you know, because like I said, when I joined the Army, it was 1975. So most of the senior people in the Army that were exposed to were Vietnam veterans. So I got to yeah. hear a lot of stories. Several of them had been POWs. So I got that aspect of it. <clears throat> Uh, I even met a few people in the first, second chapter of the book. There is a section about the Sante raid mm -hmm. in in Vietnam, and so I met some of the what they called the raiders, the original raiders, some of them. But you know, there was also the negative side of the Vietnam War, basically forgotten. There was also a lot of conspiracy theories, and there was a lot of history about what happened to POWs and. Mm -hmm. The thing I noticed over the years, because I didn't write this till after I was out of the army, a while, and so is how the Vietnam, well, POWs in general were just forgotten about. And I thought, well, if part of my motivation was to write something to keep the memory alive, is what I call it. Just keep that memory alive of whatever happened to them or what may have happened to them. Mm -hmm. You know, some might call some of the material in the book conspiracy theory. So others will say, no, it's probably what actually did happen. You know, because there's the uh, historical, I mean, people, thanks to the marvels of Google, you can Google things now and find out, oh, the, the communist policy with prisoners of war was basically to keep them, yeah. not let them go. And yeah. World War II, hundreds of thousands of Germans were kept, never released. Yeah, and you know, for and their families didn't know what happened. To them. Their families didn't. Later. The families literally didn't know if they were alive or dead, did they? No, no. Yeah, that was they didn't know. Yeah, it was just a it was a communist. It was a policy. Yeah. So, you know, some say, "Oh, that's all conspiracy stuff," but then you have people who defected over the years, like you know, military people, 
from the Soviet side or from the the uh, Warsaw Pact countries said, yeah. no, we use the process them, you know, I mean, it was just normal, normal stuff to them. And yeah. so that was part of my inspiration, really, is just to create an awareness um, of the memory of, you know, what happened to him, plus a good story. It's a great uh, story. My, yeah. My, my main character is, uh, I guess, I want to say a composite character. Right. Of, you know, so that's where that came from. It's a composite character. Uh, I also, I like stories or movies that have surprises in them, twists. So you have a big one things. near the end that I'm not going to give away, but there's a big yeah. twist near the end. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, and so that's where, you know, spoilers, I mean, I don't like spoilers. And so it's hard to talk about something without giving away a lot of the twist or things through, throughout the story. And, you know, it's, I, I've been told it was written well where it was hidden until different parts of the story. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, it is so. really well written. Yeah. And um, I like the way that you've closely aligned the story with the history at the time. You really nail that timeline all the way through, you know, and there's one part of it where you have, you know, everyone knows, well, I'm guessing everyone knows that Jane Fonda went to visit um, North yeah. Vietnam at one stage. Well, you've got her uh, making an appearance in the prison that, um, that, 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 the, that the prisoner that Jacob Walden was in at the time. Yeah. And uh, it's so <laughs> good because it makes it more real. And I was actually reading it thinking, is this, is this a true story? Wait a second. And I'm like, no, I don't think it is. But wow, you know, it's... Oh, That's just, yeah. yeah, you because you placed it so well in the time and the references you give as the time goes on, they all match what was happening in the world and the political scene at the time through like the Nixon administration and all. It's uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I really like that about it. Yeah. I had somebody complain about because they thought it was a true story, right? Until they realized it was a historical fiction. Yeah. But they thought they were mad at me because it was somebody I knew actually who was in the writing world. Yeah, and, you know, she bought the book, read it, and then she got upset because, well, it's not true. True, I thought it was a true story. Well, maybe it is true. You know, <laughs> but the but a lot of the things that happen to him in the book, they did happen to POWs. Oh yeah, you know, you know, even at the when he's first captured, I mean, he, he's shot down. Um, but when he's first captured, it's pretty horrific what he goes through. You know, there's, there's Vietnam, you know, Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, I'm presuming they may have been uh, North Vietnamese, who, you know, who used to, for a bounty, used to go and collect, you know, American servicemen right. for money. You know, those things really did go on. Yes. And it was a horrific mm -hmm. journey to get him to, to the prison in the first place. You know, how he survived that, I don't know. Yeah. So I can see I can see why someone might think it's a true story because the detail is is that good, but that's what makes it compelling. I think it's great. It really is good. Yeah. Well, I tried. So I no, did my you best. made a, You did a really good book there, and you're also a, a university lecturer. You teach uh, business and leadership. Has your business education and the fact that you're teaching it has that helped you as an author? Uh. Yeah, I mean, life in general just helps. I mean, you know, because I'm I'm a little bit older now, so I can. Uh, if you're if you're if you're younger than sixty, you're still a youngin to me because I'm sixty okay. five, six, seven, something like that. I forgot I forgot how old I was after I turned thirty. So <laughs> yeah, I had to remind myself. Oh yeah, see, even now I can't remember if I'm sixty six or sixty seven. You know, I don't know. But either yeah. way, yeah, I that, that does help a little bit. Um, you know some of the new stuff I'm working on, which is not, you know, war related, it's more mystery suspense stuff, but I'm able to incorporate some other experiences from business world and teaching yeah. and so forth into that. So, yeah. So you're the president of the Missouri writers guild. Tell me about that. Yeah. Missouri writers guild. Yeah. You know, we have the writers guild, you know, the, uh, there's local chapters like St. Louis writers guild. And, you know, so it's a large, we, we have a few hundred members in there. It's been around for like a hundred years. Wow. And, um, you know, so, you know, it's, it's a good organization. I mean, I like it. That's why I'm still there. 
Yeah. Uh, I was also the St. Louis Publishers Association. That was another one I'm a member of. And I was president of that one until a few years ago. And then I took over the Missouri Writers Guild. So Yeah, yeah. And then what else? Oh, I'm a member of the Military Writers Society of America. I'm a member of wow. that. So it's military writing. So that's another place where I get some of my uh, well, mentoring, I guess you could say. Uh, yeah. Certain certain aspects of writing books. Or write, writing this one, you know, the Forgotten Soul. That, that goes back... 10 years ago now so wow got a lot of help or suggestions from these various people in these organizations because we imagine the life of a writer to be quite a solitary one but it looks like there's a bit of a good community there and good support now oh definitely yeah i suggest anybody who wants to be a writer i would highly i would strongly suggest join writing groups yeah. because most writers aside from being prone to being an introvert they get, they call it writer's block or whatever you want to call it, you know, and eh, you can't get anywhere. But being exposed to a group at a meeting, be it on Zoom or in person, you get inspired by listening to other people's talk about what they're working on. It, yeah. it's, you know, so, you know, any future writers out there or get into, get into groups, get some inspiration, you know. Yeah. It, yeah. It's a good thing. Yeah. And that, that is, that's totally it, isn't it? Is the inspiration is, uh, you know what? Who was it said that uh, plagiarism is stealing from one source, and creativity is stealing from many? I forget who said that, but you know, yeah. and you think of any endeavor, whether you know, you know, musicians all the time will will tell you how they took a little bit of, little bit of this and a little bit of the blues and a little yeah. bit of gospel, a bit of Motown or whatever, and then it came out original. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, the creative oh, process needs that. Yeah. Yeah. One of my personal inspirations is my grandkids. I call them grand men. <laughs> um, you know, I had, um, you know, the first kid was born like 10 years ago now, but I was in these obnoxious grandparents. It used to be in the old days, people would take all the pictures out and hang them out in front and say, hey, look at all these, you know. But with the marvel of Facebook, now you do it on Facebook. So <laughs> but one of my friends, uh, one of my writing friends actually, he, approached me one night and said, hey, all this stuff you tell us you're doing on Facebook with your grandkids, why don't you write a book about it? And I said, ah, oh, there's an idea. So I did. I, I, wrote, I started a kid series, Adventures with Pop Pop, and it was just the things that we do, going to the store, going to the park, or so I do. got these books out there now. But they're a big inspiration, even though it has nothing to do with the war stuff, but yeah, these outside influences, but... But so I got the kids' books going and other stuff I'm doing. So, but anyway, but see, I just so love you, my grandkid books, right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I just did that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, when you're writing, then, do you have the reader in mind? Like, obviously, with the grandkids one, you're writing the book for them. Was it the same with, say, Forgotten Soldiers? Do you have somebody in mind that you're telling the story for? Well. Yeah, with the uh, well, with the kids book, it's yeah, you got to keep it in mind that it's going to be for kids. Yeah, you know where parents going to be reading it to them, or they're going to start. So you got to, you know, that's where an editor comes in, making sure we're using the right vocabulary that's going to be at grade level, things like that. Um, then, um, you know, for the other things I'm working on, it's like a lot of writers write. They tell you if you're writing, you're not writing for fame and for money. You know, it's what would you like? You know, so if the right. story you like yourself, you know, hopefully somebody else will like it too. And so that's my part of my. So you write for yourself first. You write a book yeah, you'd like I mean, to read. I've heard a lot of writers say that's what the primary thing is. You know, it, if you don't sell a book but you're happy with it, there you go. Yeah. That's success. You know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, people like to sell books. Oh bestseller but if you don't you shouldn't be disappointed as long as you're happy with what you did of course there's some people out there who don't want to get editors now i still say you got to get an editor for what you're writing yeah you know, yeah but. yeah and what's the process then do you do you discipline yourself to a certain amount of words per day or does do you just wait until the inspiration comes or how, how does it work yes yes and yes <laughs> <laughs> People try 
writers try to write a certain amount of words a day. That's a goal a lot of them have. But then there's days you don't. They, have, they call it writer's block, or whatever you call it. Um, uh, it. It varies. You know, some people, read, I say religiously, write their thousand words a day or two thousand, whatever it is, you know, the goal is, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's also, I, I use the um, exercise analogy, like doing push ups. You know, if I said, hey, what, go and do 100 push ups right now for me, and the average person won't be able to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you do it a little bit every day, same thing with writing. It's, yeah. You got to practice or it don't work very well. And you find out later when you go, but you put it away for a week, you put, come back and look at it and say, oh, wow, you find all these mistakes. <laughs> or you, you hand it off to the editor, right? And they send it back to you. It's like, oh, wow. Yeah. I, you know, you see what it was you did, you did wrong or didn't make any sense or didn't flow right, whatever the issue was. Mm-hmm. And have you've turned this one, Forgotten Soldiers, into an audiobook. Have you turned any of the others into audiobooks yet? No, um, not audiobooks. No. Well, the, the kids' books we, we turned into audiobooks. I'm not sure how well that works, though, for a kids' book. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. audiobooks. I mean, it, it may work, but... And I plan on doing it's the... better to uh, get the kids to read anyway, isn't it? <laughs> I yeah, thought. I mean, the whole point is for them to read, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a series, I'm working on a series now, it's called Farmerville, so I plan on putting that into audiobooks. Yeah. It'll be like a, a five, it might be a ten part series, we'll see, but yeah. we'll see how, to, how many characters die along the way or whatever, but you know, it may not get past five, we'll see. But yeah, I'll be doing audiobooks on those too, so. And how did you find the process of turning Forgotten Soldiers into an audiobook then? Oh, that was um, trial and error, I guess, or taking bits and pieces of everything I learned over the years and, you know, different people I knew, different story, you know, different war stories, I guess, of Vietnam, of POWs over, the, you know, just, just plugging it all together, you know, beginning to end and, oh, that ain't the end. Here's the real end. Yeah. Uh, so it well, was for me, cause that was my first attempt at writing. I actually had um, ended up with three different editors over the process. Yeah, that's one of the reasons that I, I'm not ashamed or whatever. One of the things I would tell people at our writing meetings, you know, we'd have monthly meetings anywhere I was at, and I would say you have to get an editor, and I would tell them the editor story. I had a so I got my book out. I finally got it done. Right, I found an editor who did it for me. Oh, this is going to be a great editor because she was an English teacher, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, that was my thought. Yeah. Well, so I, the, the logic the works for me. Uh, then a friend of mine, um, who's he? He's an actor, writer, guy. Is Ken Farmer is his name. He has a ton of books out there too, but he does his own audio books. But he called me about a week after my book out, and he said, "Hey, buddy, have you read your own book yet?" I said, what? He said, have you read your own book? I, you know, I didn't know what he was getting at at first. He says, you need to reread it. It's terrible. <laughs> the editing. So I pulled it, I pulled it and got re-edited. Yeah. And uh, so I, he actually did part of, he did like, kind of, you know, he got these different stages of editing. So I had him and one other person re-edit it for me to get, so that's the version that's out now. And what was but the yeah, issue? Just a, there was grammar issues. It was repeating. Oh, just basic uh, stuff. Oh, really? Just just yeah, uh, I mean, things that the editor's supposed to find. Things the editor's <laughs> supposed to find, you know. Yeah. And that's why, you know, you got to find the right editor for yeah. the genre you're in. Mm -hmm. Somebody's not family, probably not an English teacher, because... You know, there's all these software programs out now that people can use, and editors tell you don't use them because they don't they don't take into account dialogue. Yeah, yeah. Things like that, you know. So, but yeah. anyway, yeah. Yeah. So, well, a good deal of the dialogue in this book obviously is American, but there's Russian dialogue in there and Vietnamese. There's all sorts in there. Why did you pick 
a bloke who lives 30 miles north of London to do the book because I'm not American or Russian or Vietnamese. Well, uh, why, why did you, why did you, why would, did you choose me? Well, there, you know, there's this, it's, there's a commercial on TV. I, I don't know if you guys see it over there. T-Mobile has a commercial. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of the lines in the commercial, the guys ranting about how great T-Mobile is. And not just that, because I'm British. He does his British thing. Right. And let's, you know, there's just a thing about an accent, a certain accent. Right. And I, you know, and I asked a couple of people and they thought, you know, that might be catchy. You know, might, there's, there's a ring to it, even though it's not American, but there's a ring to an accent um and it, it works in a lot of in a lot of scenarios it works and so it's that was surprising i've done a, i've done a lot of books um where the story is about americans or obviously some of them are set in the u.s and so i read the american characters with an american accent but then i do all the narration as british and there was one I did an audition for a while ago. It was called Saving Apollo. Great book. And uh, it said it wanted an American. And I looked at the, the audition script and I thought, well, yeah, you want an American for all the Americans in the book. But I really <laughs> think the narration would work better as, as my natural British speaking voice, just as yeah. it steps, sets just slightly outside the story and tells the story. So Tell that it makes story. the characters more powerful when I'd rather than me doing an American accent for the narration. And I've done that too. I've done books where I've done an American accent for the narration. But I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think there is something about having a British accent for the narration and then the, the, na the natural accents of the characters, whether they're American, Russian, oh, yeah. Vietnamese, and whatever. That's one thing you can, I think you're able to do. I mean, I found that out. I mean, because I looked up your website and I, you had like at the time over 150 books you've done. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I can go in there and listen to samples. And it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. There's British accent there, but oh, wait a minute. There's that female character that may, you know, there's this, you know. So yeah. you had it. Yeah. Oh, it was so much fun to do. Forgotten Soldiers. It was, it's a, it's a really intense book, but it's a great, great story and there's some good techniques you use i mean you've got a, a character who's a reporter uh, you've got the family trying to track him down but you've got a, a, a reporter so he then takes it to another level and, and he gets you know like a cia guy to tell him stuff because he's a reporter which i thought was a very clever technique you know to get someone to talk because it, it would, wouldn't seem right too much if the family were acting asking these direct questions but you could see a family hiring a uh, a reporter, a journalist, to go mm -hmm. that bit deeper, and, and um, it's just really, really well written, and it's a terrific story, and uh, and I really enjoyed it. So thank you for choosing me. It was uh, really good, oh, Warren. Uh, uh, thank pleasure. you very much. What's next for you? A series I uh, call Farmerville. Oh, it's, the one you uh, mentioned. That's next, is it? That's the next yeah, project. Just, then that is next. Yeah. I just put the, well, we're what, in the middle of August right now? So I just put the book up on Amazon for pre pre order, It'll be September 1st, be available. Mm -hmm. It's called Farmerville. And it's a kind of a mystery. It's in southeast Missouri, a little mm -hmm. small town that has some secrets going on and some tragic stuff. And, you know, one of the lines in the first in the first episode, I call them episodes. They're short, maybe 10,000 words at most, but one of the lines in the first episode is not even Dr. Phil can fix this. <laughs> no. Right, right. No, that's a good line. Yeah, so you're talking about dysfunction of some kind. Yeah. Yes. Either personally or family-wise. Yeah. Wow, well, that sounds really good. So that's up, that's for sale on Amazon right now? As a uh, book? Yes. Okay, I'll put a link. In. If you're watching this on YouTube, in the description, I'll put a link to Farmerville so you can find that. I'll also put a link to the audiobook version of Forgotten Soldiers. Um, Warren Martin, thank you so much. Great to talk to you. Great to finally meet thank you. Thank you.